Making a life worth living and a retirement worth having is really about how we portray ourselves in other people's lives. It's not so much of what we think of those people, but really about what they feel for us. In my lifetime, I've had some magnificent friends who have come into my life during times of loss and times when I needed love. And in my life, they moved my soul so much that I was far more productive in life than I ever had been before. I had a soulmate who did this for me, and I literally wrote lots of works. I designed lots of things because she was in my life. And she openly changed my life with that caring way that she was, sort of like her name implies. Another friend was sort of inspiring, more of a muse of sorts, who really made me feel like I deserved more in life and that I could possibly do anything with her near me. And that's how I felt. There are people like that in your life, aren't there? People who inspire you, people who move your soul, people who help you to become more in life. When we have opportunities to help someone, when we have the means and power to help someone, it's really our opportunity to do so. When we think, I could help that so well, that's usually God moving your soul to say, I can help. When you start talking with other people, they start to give you information on insurance and all sorts of other possible concerns, you're moving away from what God is inspiring you to do. You see, it's those moments of inspiration that change lives. It's those moments of risk that make all the difference for the people in the world who are needing help. And frankly, it's those moments of risk that make life worth living. In my life, I long for those two women to come back into my life. My old gal has moved on and married someone else and sometimes reaches out, but it's never always as positive as I'd like it to be. It's not practically what we promised one another, that we'd always know each other through into old age, and that we'd always care for one another's families and for our child that we shared the parenting of. But in life, sometimes a man is replaced. In my life, I've met some amazing women, two very different souls who made all the difference in my life. And they made such a difference that when I lost them, I was never the same. If I could do anything to fix those relationships, I would do everything in my power to do so. That's what Lord God encourages in the Bible. Regardless of what faith you practice or what philosophy you read into, they all pretty much say the same thing. Love God, honor other people, create peace in the world, and in doing so, you produce forgiveness for people. You go to them with a heart of gold and say, listen, we had a breakdown in communication and I really sort of miss you in my life. And I'd like to get back together and just start anew and give it another whirl and see where it goes and see if there's an opportunity to make amends and to create a new way of looking at life together. Perhaps our lives would improve if we were in one of each other's lives. And a lot of times that's the truth, that that person that was supposed to literally be with us through the thick and thin until the end of time in terms of our soul keepers and those types of relationships which create and form the soul strings of our lives like the title of my book implies is literally about how we move people's souls to become all they can be how we inspire them how we love them into good healthy situations in their lives in their professions in their careers in their family situations with their children and how we encourage them to seek god first and love man second when we do this, we move our souls to become something more. We literally profess the name of the Lord in everything that we do, but only if we're honoring people in those moments. You see, if we're only honoring ourselves in our own ideology or our own thinking about what is right for someone else, we have failed to honor God completely. You see, it's the souls that go to heaven later in life, not the body, not the physical form, not anything that person has ever purchased or created in terms of material wealth, none of that goes with us. When we transition to heaven, we literally slip away. We slip through a stream of sorts, and we go and we meet our maker. At least that's what many people of faith believe. I can't profess to be an expert in it. I know that when I was slipping out of myself, I realized it and said, whoa, what's going on here? I'm not quite sure I'm ready for this. But practically, it might have been to save me from all the mayhem that I've been experiencing the last few years of my life. And practically, it might have been in response to my request that if the one I loved couldn't find it in her heart to forgive me, then maybe I should go home to heaven, because trying to bear life without her in my life was too much to bear. Now, thankfully, I've healed. 
I've moved on. I've done a lot of things in life. I've seen a lot of the Midwest. I've traveled. I've explored the land. I've seen the beauty of the farms in Indiana, and I've literally tried to encourage others to do the same. I've also tried to help people who needed help, and I literally would give up my shirt for the people that I love, but openly that list is few and far between. You see, once we've gone through things with others that don't produce the same sort of results we hoped they would, we might not be the same person. But in reality, we're always growing, we're always learning, we're always stretching, but we always can find forgiveness. We always can find a way to forgive someone who loves us dearly. Isn't that the truth? If they truly love us dearly, then they are concerned with our life and the way that we long for it to go. Not the way that some other man thinks our life should go. That practically is the problem in the world, that there are a lot of people who feel they have the right to make comment on what another soul is doing in their world. In truth, the soul is what is designed by the Lord. It is put together in a mixture between the mother and father who produced that child, and that child eventually becomes an adult that is producing results in the world. The only question is, what sort of results is that man producing? Is that man producing loving statements? Is that man trying to tell people the truth about the law? Is that man really doing honorable things under the Lord's tutelage? You see, when a man thinks he knows more about the world than God, it's sort of a scary proposition to be in for the rest of us. When a man literally thinks he has the right to manhandle someone and destroy their life, he pretty much is off base with Lord God in his life. You see, there's nothing in any biblical work or any religious work of any kind that says, go destroy the lives of another person. Go take their property, go steal their information, go destroy who they are seen as with the people that they respect and regard or with their relationships. You see, that is the work of the satanic force. That is a lie that's being told to men that they should go out and police the world. That is not true. Protectors of the world protect the soul first. They listen to people, they hear what's going on, they listen to the problems, they help them sort things out, they literally help them to move forward in life from sticky situations. They don't try and make things more difficult for someone because they don't believe in something a person believes in, or they don't like a person's psyche, or they don't realize a person's abilities. You see, most people make snap judgments, they make instant decisions that can literally harm someone's life. You see, you can't do that in the world and not be noticed by the Lord. In my life, I've totally understood how that works. I've realized the missteps I've made with certain people and I've apologized, feeling humiliation that I made those missteps. I would like to apologize to someone for never calling on a Wednesday when I promised, but I just was overwhelmed with what was going on in my life at that time, and I couldn't take one more rejection, and yet it still came. I have longed to see that person for the longest time, and I literally want to know that she is okay. I'd love to know how her children are faring, how her new life is forming after losses of her own, and literally, I would like to see her again. I have actually get signs for her almost every day. They are signs that I've learned and discovered, and they are so uncanny that I can't say they're not signs. I literally have seen our initials together on trucks. I've literally seen them on the days that I was to see her. I've literally been told when I'm supposed to see her, and then I see panel trucks for the places in which she worships. You see, there's always a sign that's delivered from God about something that we're supposed to be doing. There's always a sign that we can make in the promise that we keep with our Lord by saying, Lord, if you show me these symbols, I'll know he's the one or she's the one or this is the right project for me. Or Lord, let me know how to hear you better, how to be more wise in my decision-making process. Let me know how to love people greater. Let me know how to solve this issue that I've made a mess of in my own life and in another's. You see, when we put God first, we stop trying to harm other people's lives. When we put God first, we literally see the magic that he and she offers to the world. When we stop judging people based on looks and money and start looking at their souls in terms of what Lord God feels about them, then we might just find the partner of our lives. In my life, I'm looking for that one. I've had two come and two go that were almost perfect for me. I had one long ago who was perfect for that time of my life through the lessons of my life in parenting, in partnership, 
in couplehood, and all the things that having a partner in life, in business, and in personal life bring. I've also met others who were brought to me in times of need in their lives and times of need in my life, and know that they are to be with me for the long term. I miss both of those people as well as my original spouse, but she's moved on, as I said earlier in this audio cast. And what I'm talking about now literally is how do we move forward after losing the most important people of our lives. Birth family is someone that we grow up with. It's someone that we might have some associations with in our youth, but if there's years apart between us, we literally don't have the same friends, we don't have the same opportunities, we don't have the same social networks, and we literally don't have the same careers. When we move forward into adulthood, we might spend time together at holidays, we might have occasional picnics together to celebrate someone's birth or someone's uh, graduation, but openly it's not a real relationship. It's not a daily conversation of talking about the goals of a person's life or how we're going to help one another to move forward in a life. But when we produce our own families, we are looking for who is the most apt to be able to help me in this situation to grow forward in my life in a way that honors Lord God. And who is the most appropriate person to manage my household, to handle my situation, to help my children, to uh, mentor my teens, and openly to help bring them into a mature social, be acceptable point of adulthood so that they will be functioning, performing members of a social society a performing, career-oriented individual. Now, I'm sort of being attacked here by mosquitoes, which is sort of difficult at this time of year. Literally, the rains have come and gone, and we are stuck with what's left. So if I allow this video to go forward as it is, you might see me shooing a few flies and a few uh, skeeters, but openly, that's my little right. I'm apparently sweet to them all, and the sweat bees certainly love me. But in truth, Lord God loves us all more. He totally sends us the people that should be in our lives. He takes away people that have failed us in our lives. And he openly shows us who loves us in our lives. When people fail to show others love, when people fail to show other people's regard, when people fail to show other people's regard and respect for their souls internally and put all the emphasis on the external, Lord God is not honored. So I guess what I'm saying in life is that the soul is the most important thing that we need to honor in this world. And when a soul is not honored, she is not happy in her relationship. Her children are miserable in her selection, and openly she is not happy in the money and the wealth that her family is producing for that life worth living and that retirement worth having. You see, when you grow old, you want someone who will love you no matter what. You want someone who will tend your needs if you become ill. You want someone who will never give up on you no matter what. You want someone who will fight for you and literally throw down with any man who tries to harm you. And that's the type of person you want in your life. Have you literally found that partner in your male or female counterparts? Or have you literally given up and given in to someone who's not right for you? That's what we're talking about here. Life partners, soul keepers, the soul strings of our life, like my book talks about. I literally go through in each stage of a person's mature adulthood, the relationships that are most significant, and how those relationships help to form us, damage us, or raise us to a higher level in life. This has been Blake Enson of Blaze Communications LLC, talking about soul keepers and how vitally important they are to the maturation and education of our souls, but also for the celebration and tribulations and all the other aspects of living a life worth living and having a retirement worth having.